Welcome. I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. This TV series explores a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. One of the recurring themes in this TV series is that we are all interconnected. No matter what issues we address on this program, we find ourselves uh, very often affirming our common humanity across nations, across social and economic groups, and so forth. This month's program takes a fresh look at people who are in the military on active duty and veterans who have served in the military. While the peace movement opposes wars and our violent foreign policy, we recognize that the individuals who serve or have served in the military are human beings just like ourselves, and they are literally our brothers and sisters. Some members of the peace movement, like our two guests for this program, have served in the military. The peace movement recognizes the humanity with all people who are victims of war, and indeed, many people who serve in the military are also victims of war. Just as we want civilians to be healed and restored to peace, so also we want health and peace for all who have served in the military. It's only fair that GIs and veterans be able to fully exercise their rights related to the benefits for which they're eligible. And these are the themes that we'll be exploring during this program. I'm happy to welcome Dennis Mills and Mark Fleming. Both Dennis and Mark served in the United States Army during the Vietnam era. Both are very active now in the peace movement. Both of these guests are active with Veterans for Peace, Chapter 109, the Rachel Corey chapter in Olympia, Washington. And Dennis is very active also with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. Both Dennis and Mark volunteer significant time and effort at the Coffee Strong Coffee House south of Tacoma, Washington, where they help active duty GIs and veterans know about their rights and claim their rightful benefits. And Mark has qualified as an independent VA accredited claims agent. So I'm happy to welcome Dennis Mills and Mark Fleming. We will have a very informative uh, hour with uh, information that probably not too many of our uh, viewers know enough about. So welcome, good to have you here. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's just briefly lay out what it is that you do as volunteers at Coffee Strong. Um, people should know that the Coffee Strong Coffee House was named after that Army slogan, yes. Army Strong. And if you're going to have a coffee house next to an army base, you might as well name it Coffee Strong. So t tell us about the, um, well, just briefly. Coffee Strong is a GI-owned and GI-operated coffee house just off of exit 122 off of Highway 5 in, near Lakewood, Washington. Mm -hmm. And it serves coffee to uh, predominantly GIs that come in free. And uh, they have an internet uh, cafe there. Um, but where Mark and I became involved with it is that we see a lot of GIs and also veterans coming through that have some claims that they're interested in getting some compensation or health care. And that's where we started saying, well, maybe we should sit in and just talk on Fridays. And that, that's how we got involved. Right. And so pretty much every Friday, one or both of you will be up there from currently it's 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. It may change right. if people are watching this program substantially later than our taping date. Um, but anyway, you're up there volunteering and helping these folks out. Right, and part of it is people just don't know how to access the process. Mm -hmm. So this is something we do. We can help them figure it out what, what they can get and how they go about it. It used to be a very complicated process at one time. What was it, 16 pages? 16 pages to apply. And, and uh -huh. that really put a lot of people off. And, and now it's really online uh, thing, but we really help them saying here's what you, uh, need to know to file successfully yeah. because if they don't know what they're doing it can be turned down and then it's a six month to nine month uh, appeal process and yeah. we're there to help them know what yeah. they need to to uh, have in place to file. Uh, Dennis, one of the things that you've mentioned is that um, war changes people. When yes. some, the, and you've said that the person who gets deployed is a different person when he or she comes home. Tell us some more about that. Well, that, that combat experience uh, changes people. They come home from the war, but the war actually comes home with them. And many times it is a psychological wound 
of them having been in combat or having experienced uh, death. And many times what we see that is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, but we also see other things that, such as brain injuries, uh, TBI we call it, traumatic brain injuries. Mm -hmm. And that's a little harder uh, to deal with. And they're coming home with those things and how they relate to others uh, is really uh, difficult. And so we're seeing them come in all the time, uh, not just with physical wounds that they need to get treated for, like a, a knee that hurts, yeah. but also they have some mental issues and that triggers other mental things which can be a challenge. Yeah. And it also makes it difficult for them to follow through a process that can seem pretty complicated if you haven't paid attention to it. Well, a lot of people um, don't, don't like to deal with bureaucracies. Right. It's like a foreign subject. Yes, and, yes. And so if you're not geared that way, it's, it's a, a barrier. And some of the issues that Mark and I are trying to get them to file on uh, trigger other things which then become the more predominant issue that they're dealing with but we're trying to get them back into getting them care and also compensation uh -huh. for their war-related injury. So um, I heard you folks talk about the, the large numbers of people who've been affected by war. Tell us what kind of numbers we're talking well, about. Well, in the United States, there's at least almost a third of the people that have been related to the military in one way or another. And in the state of Washington, which is pretty amazing, over 667,000 like have, uh, have served in the military. And currently, Mark and I are now working uh, very, um, very hard right now with the Vietnam veterans because we have some 225,000, almost a quarter mm -hmm. million people mm -hmm. that served in country. And some of the uh, health issues that they're beginning to experience is related to their service. And so we're looking at a quarter million right now in the state of Washington. And we'll talk about some of these delayed effects mm -hmm. a little bit later in the program that just because uh, somebody's military service was decades ago doesn't mean that you can't apply now. Well, and correct. it's not we'll only the, the person, the veteran that we're talking about, but sometimes it's their dependent and their survivors okay. that are eligible for some of the compensation. Uh, I think you had said that like every five minutes somebody walks into a VA... A VA health center or, yeah. or a hospital, yeah. yes. Um, and um, uh, let's see, what, what kinds of uh, injuries, uh, whether physical or unseen, visible or invisible, uh, are, are people doing? You, you mentioned Actually, when some. we're seeing a variety of them, I mean, uh, typically someone will come in, you know, the classic one is they it had some direct injury. They, they were wounded in the shoulder, they fell, there was something physically wrong with something specific. And very often, if you talk to them a bit, you might find out, well, there's more to it. You know, they're having nightmares. They're having, you know, they, they injured this shoulder, but because of their having to compensate, their other shoulder is a problem, or they're seeing additional problems. Mm -hmm. So very often, if you interview this person and talk to them, you can get a sense that, well, there's several things that we can claim. And one thing you can do with these claims is you file you know, you, re you list out everything you think the VA should look at, and they have to look at that and say yes or no. And mm -hmm. it's typical, and Mark, you can uh, relate to the fact that we had a person come in with just maybe one or two, and by the time that we finished going through them, what we call from head mm -hmm. to toe, because mm -hmm. uh, we asked certain questions, and we mm -hmm. have that credibility of having served that we can speak their language. Mm -hmm. You know, we would say, how many times did you hit the deck? Well, mm -hmm. to the civilian audience, that doesn't mean a whole lot. But uh -huh. to the veteran, that means full body armor with a pack, mm -hmm. 120 pounds, hitting the thing, and that has yeah. an impact on your body. Right. Right. But right. how many claims did, you know, we landed up with that one person? Well, I'm thinking someone came in, it had about one or two items. We had about 11 by the time we finished. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. and, we had and, another one who had been, he's working, he's still in active duty, but and they, they were considering medical dis issues that, they had about nine. Mm -hmm. He went to the VA, and they identified 27. Yeah, and what you're doing is you're not settling for just the superficial or the the uh, whatever is the presenting mm -hmm. illness, but you're you're getting right into it deep enough. Because you're so thorough because uh, I, I I know from the work that you're doing, you're approaching these people with with compassion and understanding, and you're really trying to help them out. And when you get into that kind of thoroughness, then the other things will, will surface. Well, and, and many times it's just, Glenn, listening to the person. And sometimes it's the first time that they've been listened to 
in a long time. Uh -huh. um, uh, yeah, uh, let's see, I think you would mentioned uh, hearing loss. Yes, most of the people that have been in combat have been uh, around large noises, whether it's from mortars or grenades or whatever the sound was, even in their uh, advanced infantry training. They're around large noises, and that mm -hmm. noise has had an impact to where they develop hearing problems, where there's a ringing in the ear. We call it tinnitus, mm -hmm. and uh, that is compensatable right now. Uh, any veteran who has this, even if they don't get compensation for that hearing loss, will get hearing aids for the rest of their life. And mm -hmm. we're looking at two, $3,000 yeah. for just the hearing aids. And just and about all the people that have been around uh, an infantry unit so will have that issue. Will have that issue. Uh -huh. And some, for the first time, are saying, Dennis, Mark, uh, what's this thing about hearing loss and hearing aids? You know, because yeah. I have that problem. Right. And they've been quiet about this for maybe 30 or more years. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Like I said, you don't even, you should apply as soon as you get out, as soon as you realize you have an issue. But very often people don't realize that until many years later, and well, you can still make those claims. And there's also sort of a cultural thing that says, you know, you don't want to be a whiner, you right. don't want to be a baby about it, you got to be a tough guy, just mm -hmm. suffer in silence, that kind of a cultural thing. Uh, that would be a barrier. Well, many times if you're in country in a combat situation and you're hurt, they give you a pain med, uh, nothing more than a strong yeah. Tylenol, and back on duty. Yeah. And there's also an ethos that says, well, I'm hurt, but this is my unit. I need to be with them. I don't care. So right. it's a combination of both command yeah. influence and the soldier's well, own desire. Yeah, loyalty to the group yeah. and people count on each other. And, and that's and an extreme that's powerful. Uh, bond. Yeah. But what we're also finding with our veterans is that they've had an injury, but that injury has become more aggravated because they've compensated for it. Let's say they've had a knee problem, uh -huh. so they favored the other knee mm -hmm. over a period of time. And now that they're uh -huh. getting to be our age, <laughs> uh -huh. um, they're developing arthritis and other type of things. And most of them don't realize they can be compensated yeah. for that because it was an injury related to yeah. um, their service uh, overseas. A while back I heard a presentation you made about uh, uh, traumatic brain injury, which you've said is sort of the, the signature injury of this war. Tell us what traumatic brain injury well, or traumatic, TBI yeah, is. Yeah, TBI is an injury to the brain when there is a concussion or a large explosion where the brain is very soft and it's like it's enveloped in, in jello, but yeah. it'll be a f backward motion and then the brain will go f forward. And so it strikes back and forth and, and there's uh, some severe damage that's caused by this. Uh, and we're seeing these TBIs caused by Here's another acronym, IED, which yeah. is an improvised explosive device. Right. And we're seeing this more in uh, Afghanistan than we are in Iraq, although it happened in Iraq quite right. a bit too. And people are coming home and they think it's maybe uh, PTSD and it's not. It's a traumatic brain injury and they're not being tested adequately. Remember the one test we had with one guy? Oh, where right. We said, how many IEDs did you go through? He said 40 or something. 40? And or I he lost a, count. He lost count after 40 and a blown out eardrum. And we says, well, what test did they give you? And they says, well, they gave me a word association test. Uh -huh. Do you remember uh, my expression at the time, Mark? Okay. I, and I says, hold out your hand. And he held out his hand. And I says, a word association test, huh? Uh -huh. Yeah, so, I mean, there is neurological damage. And yeah. you know, people just tip it very often when you come back from that situation, you just want to put it behind you. So even if you don't, even if you're just trying to avoid being a whiner, you know, you just say, I, want to, I don't want to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you mentioned PTSD just now, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. In World War I, uh, it was called shell shock. Yes. In World War II, the same symptoms were called battle fatigue. And now, uh, since Vietnam, uh, it's been referred to as post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, even in the Civil War, it was called soldier's heart. Oh, I, didn't, yeah, I hadn't yeah. heard that. I'm not, I guess I'm not as old as you are. I wouldn't. <laughs> and the fact that it, it's called that. a disorder makes it very difficult for soldiers to recognize that. I mean, it's an injury, yeah. uh, yet it's a disorder, and I'm a tough soldier, so I don't have a yeah. disorder. Yeah, it sounds um, like a psych psychological problem. There's another so term it's... now called combat stress injury. Uh -huh. And that, you know, you think about that in the terms that it's a wound that can heal as opposed to disorder, which is something wrong with me. Well, and that's why we talk about the unseen wounds of war, right. mm -hmm. where we're seeing just about everyone that's been deployed uh, by the uh, 
the Department of Defense own statistic, well over 35, 37% will have issues with PTSD as a result of them being in a combat situation. And then that affects not just them, but their friends, family members. Community at large. Yeah. 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 And, you know, it's not uncommon for people, if you were to go down the street, and you've probably heard me say this before, mm -hmm. Glenn, mm -hmm. is I'll go up to a, a person and say, uh, what war were you in? Yeah. And, you know, some of the people that were never around, it's just, that's a strange question to ask. I said, did you hear the answer? Uh -huh. And they will tell you what battle, what war it was. Yeah. And they were on the street because they have not had their needs met. Yeah, there's a, a very high rate of homelessness. Yes. And um, substance abuse, all kinds of stuff. And loss out of, of relationships, divorce yeah. mm -hmm. is very yeah. rampant. Yeah. And we've seen that in the community here as soldiers come back to uh, Fort Lewis. Yeah. Uh, high rate of divorce, uh, drunken driving, uh, domestic abuse. Yeah. Dependency issues of alcohol and other yeah. drugs. Um, it's, it's become um, known, uh, not reported enough, but become known somewhat that the Department of Defense does several things to try to avoid taking responsibility for the damage that it's caused to people. Right. Um, and I wonder if you could tell us about some, some yeah, of their methods. Yeah, and Mark, we, methods. we see a yeah. lot of people coming in that are in uniform. And they're in some kind of a process. I mean, a classic one is, it's called chapter, chaptering out, an administrative discharge. Uh, the person can no longer function as a soldier, and they say, well, it's a personality discharge. It's your problem, not ours. And they, give, they will typically give them a general discharge, which bars them from education benefits. And in some cases, they might even give them a less than honorable discharge, uh, which bars them from any benefits. And Keep, if they lose their education benefits and they've paid into it, they well, lose, they lose, they lose well. what they paid into yes. it. And they don't tell you that very much when well, you yeah. recruit. And one of the things we're doing at Coffee Strong with these people is, you know, we're telling them that there's a very definite process that you go through. They have to do certain things. And one of my favorites is I will print out a copy of the regs and say, you know, here are the things they have to tell you. And if they don't give you this information, if they don't give you the time, then you can demand it. And that's hard to do if you're, you know, an E4 and yeah. your first sergeant is barking down at you. Now, one of the things you should know, uh, Glenn, in our listening audience, is we're talking generally about veterans benefits, but we move mm -hmm. into an area which is not our expertise, which is GI rights yeah. uh, information. Yeah. And Coffee Strong is another place yeah. for people to come and get that type of information. Right, and there is a, a, a GI rights hotline, uh, which is toll free, you can call it uh, at no cost, 877-447-4487. Four four eight seven, and they have a website www.girightshotline.org, and we'll include that in the credits at the end of right. the program. And, and we get people coming in, and we thought they're not here for to talk with Mark and myself. Yet we'll talk with them. Yeah. They're here because they need GI rights uh, information, right. and yeah. we refer them to where they can get the type yeah. of information those, they want. And those folks are well trained. The it's staffed by volunteers. But they've gone through training like you folks have gone through training, yeah. and they, they can really help these, these An folks out. Another thing that we've, we've encountered with sold active duty is uh, people who are up for some sort of a medical discharge. Mm -hmm. And the process that gets dragged out, and they say, well, we'll give you this 10% if you just sign now. And it's been three months, and you sign it to get out. And we had w one GI who had an issue with his son who had contracted a disease that the father had brought home and needed this medication, and they were offering him very minimal care. And that medication was $100,000 a year yeah. uh -huh. for the pharmacy. Uh -huh. He was able to stick it out and get the full benefit. Okay. Well, yeah, one of the things that, that happens, um, and this was, uh, there was a great article in The Nation magazine mm -hmm. uh, sometime in 2010. Oh, the Disposable Soldiers? Was. Yeah, it was about these people who get labeled with a personality yes. disorder which the, the military says, well, that's, you, you don't have an injury from the war, you have a personality disorder, it's a pre-existing condition, and we don't have any responsibility for it. And they're doing this um, at a vastly increasing rate as a way of avoiding liability. And well, and, and that is a challenge too, because we have people with really pretty severe PTSD coming uh -huh. in, and if you want to get them out, you give them 
crazy orders to follow that they will blow their lid on and then oh. they will say, oh, Article 15 uh, or personality disorder. Uh -huh. Failure them, to adapt. Failure to adapt. Another get them event. out of here. You okay. know, where, and, and they know that the issue was they have untreated PTSD, yeah. but that was the easy way to get yeah. rid of them so that the Department of Defense does not have to pick up the, uh, the finances that they would owe that person for the rest of their life. Yeah, and it's an interesting thing that in, in a society where there is so much emphasis on accountability, you know, uh, politicians want to make welfare moms accountable, and they want to make drunk drivers accountable, and they want to make, you know, teachers accountable. They want to make everybody accountable, but the Department of Defense does all these um, sneaky and and even crooked mm -hmm. things to avoid accountability to the very people that that they've damaged. Our heroes, supposedly. Yeah, hero. yeah. 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 Well, and one of the interesting things they use the term prior personality disorder. Yes. Remember hearing that one, Mark? And I asked um, an individual of very, very high rank, mm -hmm. um, what test did you give to this person when they came into the service that would let you know that they had anything prior? And uh, this person gave me their business card and says, well, call this person in the morning, you know, because I sort of embarrassed and called it for huh. what it was. Uh -huh. There was nothing prior. There was yeah. no test. Yeah. And what we tell all the people that have any medical issues is once they get through basic training, then the Department of Defense has accepted them. Has accepted them. And right. so they can't say, oh, well, you had this when you were 18 years old before you came in. If yeah. they made it through that basic yeah. training, uh, they were performing at that time. Exactly. Yep, they yeah. didn't. That yeah. was their time to discover, yeah. and they didn't, and it didn't go in the record. Right. So now we have. Uh, they have a legitimate right to file for benefits. Now, what do you advise somebody who comes to you and says, "I'm, uh, my term of service is almost done. I'm getting ready to get out." Uh, you have some advice that you give them about their medical. Uh, yeah, I mean, situation. We, we tell you, know, we try to prep them for you know making claims if if there is. So get your records, make sure you can document your service. If you think you have an issue, you know, particularly uh, combat related issue, uh, where there may not be a record, you know, talk to your buddies, get statements about what happened when. As much as possible, you want to try to line up all this information so that you have it so you can file because, and one of the things we've, we see it uh, with GI is about to process out, they cannot get their records because, well, it's not available yet, we're not done with it, they leave the service, the records stay there, and suddenly it's going to take them a while to get those records. Yeah. So as much as possible, you try to keep copies of the records. And if they're about to get out, Glenn, the other thing is we need to say, well, how much longer do you have mm -hmm. on your enlistment period to get out? Do you have enough time molested where you can wade through this uh, medical hold that you will be in while they determine if the Department of Defense will compensate you. If it's down to a month or two months, most of us would say it's probably not worth extending mm -hmm. your enlistment period for that, and yet then we'll show them how they can apply for VA benefits. Mm -hmm. Now the Veterans Administration, the VA, has more benefits than a lot of people are aware of. Yes. Uh, and and I know part of what you do is is help people get things that they didn't know was possible. Right. Uh, tell us what some I mean, of these we, other. We've been dealing primarily with you know service connected disability payments, uh, but there are also you know there's the, the veg education benefits, medical care, home loans, uh, and then a whole range of d dependent benefits. I mean those are like I didn't know about these before I started this. Uh, you know, for dependent parents, dependent children, education benefits for them. Uh, so there is this wide range. Dennis has the book here, and it's readily available from the VA, called Federal Benefits for Veterans, Dependents and Survivors. Mm -hmm. And it gives a, a full list of these things. Including burial uh, benefits mm -hmm. as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Living assistance uh, benefits. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you work with folks, one of the important concepts that you deal with is service-connected disability, and we've yes, mentioned this right. already. Um, can you define what qualifies as a service-connected disability? Okay. Well, there are three things that make up a service-connected disability. You know, first is you have to have a diagnosis of a condition, a uh, disabling condition. Uh, the second is that you have to be able to cite some event that is reasonably related to it. 
And the third is to establish a linkage between that. Okay. So if you are, you know, have no use of your arm because you were shot you, you, in the arm, you have this diagnosis that you're, you can't use your arm, you have the medical record of this uh, injury to your arm, and you can say it happened in combat, therefore mm -hmm. it's, it's connected. That's a simple version of yeah. it. Yeah, and then the, the more interesting cases would, would right. you'd have to do more digging to make the connection. And the closer that the person can file for benefits from the time that they uh, exited the service, or ETS as we use the term, yes. within that one year's period, is easier for that person to uh, file a claim. And then, go ahead. Yeah, and I mean there are, and there are certain things like we just talked about what I just described as a direct service connection. There is also what's an aggravated uh, connection. In other words, you had a problem when you came into the service, but because of your service and the activity, it got worse. That's service connected. Okay. There are a variety. Dennis just mentioned the presumptive uh, injury or conditions that occur within a year of the service. Uh, there are also presumptive uh, conditions uh, related, say, to Agent Orange for Vietnam veterans, mm -hmm. such as Parkinson's, ischemic heart disease. There's about 10 of them now. Diabetes type 2. Right. Uh -huh. uh, there are, and the same for Gulf War veterans. So yeah. some things are just simply pre presumptive. That's the quarter million people we yeah. talked about just in the state right. of Washington alone. And so the term presumptive means that if you were there at that time and you develop this later, it's presumed that that's right. where you got it. Yes. And so, so it, it eases the burden of proof on you. For example, on, on you. Uh, I had diabetes type 2. I was not in country. I'm Vietnam era. Uh -huh. I served in Alaska. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, my friend served in Vietnam, type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. he's covered. Yeah. Okay. Because of the uh, relationship to Agent Orange exposure. Yeah. And one of the other things, too, about the service-connected disability, you know, they rate you on percentage uh, from 10, actually 0 to 100, 100 being you're totally disabled and can't earn a living. If you're rated 30% or more, then you qualify for, I think, I think it's for a priority category of health care. In other words, if you have a 30% disability, you are guaranteed health care at the VA. Whereas anyone who doesn't can get health care, but if they run out of money, they get cut out of, off, they, off the list. Okay. Let's talk just a bit about how to apply for VA benefits. If you could summarize a little bit, and then we, we can get into a bit more detail. I can uh, start the one thing off, and then I'll turn it okay. over to Mark, who is the independent... VA claims agent in our okay. group. Right. A DD-214 is the document that every veteran <clears throat> gets when they exit the service. And generally, we're looking at that DD-214 to see is it an honorable discharge or a general discharge under honorable conditions, because we can do that. That's the priority document that we look for. And if they don't have that document, then we show where they can help them uh, to get that document. Mm -hmm. But they will need that with anything with the VA. Right. But essentially that proves that they were in the service, that they have, you know, they have a record of service. Uh, from there, uh, they would take that to a VA regional office. Uh, that's the nearest one here is in Seattle. Uh, and depending on what it is they're looking for, I mean, the ideal claim would be, I have a physical condition that's disabling. So you want to have a diagnosis of that from a doctor saying, this is as likely as not a result of military service. So now you have a condition, you've got a military, you've got a record of service, you point to some, something that occurred. And the classic one is, we will look at that DD-214 and see like, what awards he has. Uh, combat action badge, combat infantry badge. Those things mean this person was in combat. Mm -hmm. So you can very often say, because they were in combat, these things have happened. Mm -hmm. So now you have the diagnosis, you have the DD-214. Uh, you can fill out uh, a form, was it, uh, VA form 21-526EZ. Yeah. Uh, that's Six a short, pages. short form, uh -huh. form. It just kind of lists out what you have, and you can submit that. And if you have everything in place, you know, they can process it. Now, if they're out of the service, then we say you go to your, the doctor, or any place that you've been admitted. And if you can get the doctor's statement to say, and Mark already used the term, yeah. it is as likely as not that, fill in the blank, yeah. and that will help them when they apply for the VA benefits. And then the VA will call that person in for the interview, and we'll have the separate 
mm -hmm. things, but they will have those records. And yeah. VA may want to do their own examination, uh -huh. which they can do. Yeah, and you, you folks have, have emphasized um, in your other earlier work that it's good to get the documents ready as early. Yes. Get the, uh, you know, don't just put in something and then wait and get something else later because you're going to delay your yeah. thing. Yeah. If, you, if you get as much stuff as you can at the outset, right. it'll make things go Including quicker. Including statements from your friends. We call them buddy statements yeah. who noticed something happened at a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. They were there or they heard this person complaining of this ailment uh -huh. at a certain time. And mm -hmm. then that could be dated back to yeah. when this injury took place. Right. So you're uh, so-and-so... Uh, 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 was complaining that his left shoulder was hurting, but he had not complained about it before that particular incident uh, where he got the injury and, and he's been mentioning it, or a spouse uh, that talks about PTSD uh, behaviors after deployment versus behaviors right, before. Right, exactly. And that can document, so even like a spouse or a parent or a sibling Indeed. or somebody can be a a, a statement that helps document PTSD. And sometimes yeah. you can be admitted to uh, an ER uh, for whatever, and then the doctor's statement says this person has PTSD uh -huh. on one of their statements where they're filling out everything. They may have yeah. an eating disorder, some yeah. of the other type of things uh -huh. that they came in under, but that statement, PTSD, and it's signed by a doctor, then that becomes documentation yeah. that we help them yeah. assemble. And from there, I mean, the process goes into the regional office where they will make a decision and say yes or no. They will say, okay, if it's yes, then they will say, here is what we, how we rate it and inform the veteran. And at that point, the veteran can accept it or they can disagree. And then that, that, that gets into a whole process of appeals and re-reviews yeah. at the regional office. And then it can continue on to the Board of Veterans' Appeals, to the Court of Appeals for Veterans' Affairs. And one thing to point out that this process is supposed to be non-adversarial at the regional office mm -hmm. and, and even at the Board of Veterans Appeals. Once it gets into the Court of uh, Appeals for Veterans, of, uh, for Veterans Affairs, it becomes adversarial. But VA is supposed to be somewhat like workers' comp. The idea is, you know, we're here to make you whole. Uh -huh. uh, it doesn't quite always work that way, yeah. which is why we have advocates and attorneys involved right. in the process. Right. But as much as you can get in place early on, the faster it will go. And, and you folks have mentioned um, that if somebody is looking at benefits for spouses, survivors, dependents, whatever, that they may need to get documentation about uh, birth certificates or marriage licenses right. or whatever, and that those are available and through the... And divorce statements as well. Those, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. those kinds of things, and those were available... Uh, from a county health department or the state, the state yeah. department of health has yeah. vital records. Well, now with Agent Orange exposure affecting some 226,000 in the state of Washington, many of these people are dying off now because of those ailments. Their dependents and their survivors can be compensated. Yeah. Um, and if they know about it. If they knew about and it. And that's the problem is yeah. most people don't know about it. Yeah. And we've had people that uh, the husband received VA benefits, then died, mm -hmm. but the the wife and the daughters knew nothing about it, right. you know, and... They it, took the burial benefit, benefits, got the flag, and that was it. And and that it, was it. Yeah, yeah. And some of these claims come in many years later. You, you yeah. told me you're working with a guy uh, who had been bitten by a rat in Korea, Korea. in that, 1955 or something. And that started a whole chain of events. They denied him compensation originally, and he appealed that, and he got a little, and... He's still appealing. He's finally gotten uh, much of his claim, but he's still saying, well, you're only giving me back to a few years ago. I put this claim in many years ago. Uh -huh. So it can go on. This, I think in his case, it's over 40 years. Well, and Mark, you can tell your own story about, you know, you filed for PTSD and 30 years 30, after the 30, fact? Yeah, 30 years after the fact and was rated for it. Hmm. Well, there, there's... Um, We've mentioned, uh, you know, the Gulf War syndrome and Agent Orange, and um, the the uh, uh, we haven't mentioned depleted uranium, but these are weapons and problems from past wars. And in in so many of these cases, the government has avoided responsibility. They were denying that there was mm -hmm. anything like uh, Gulf War syndrome. Mm -hmm. Oh no, this doesn't exist. That's just a Agent Orange fluke. was not a problem. They they denied that, 
and uh, they were just there. There's this long pattern where the government refuses to take responsibility for what it's doing to people, uh, and they're still dragging their feet on on depleted uranium, which is uh, causing all kinds of problems for people here as well as people in in the countries where that's been used. Well, this highlights the total cost of war, which is the thing that motivates Mark and myself as Veterans for Peace, Chapter 109, is the total cost of war. It is not just what you pay for the bullets and bombs. Right. It goes on forever. And it what? goes on and on and on and affects others around you. Yeah. Well, and people need to know about right. those costs. Right. You mentioned that, that the, the year with the highest cost of of paying for World War II veterans was 1993. Right, that was the peak year for paying medical claims for World War II veterans. So close to 50 years after the yeah, fact, yeah. we're still paying for it. Yeah. And something to keep in mind about the, the current wars is, you know, World War II, I think the killed to wounded ratio was something like one to three, in Vietnam it was one to four. Because of the better medical care in the current wars, it's one to 15. So you have many people coming back who are severely wounded who are yeah. going to require this kind of care right. well into the future. Right. So even though you don't have the mass mobilization that you had in World War II, just the, all the casualties are going to add up. Right. So the people who are um, the, the, the fiscal hawks, the deficit hawks, the people who want to cut benefits, uh, cut education, cut environmental care, cut um, children's services and all that, um, they need to recognize that, that wars are causing costs. If they want to get serious about cutting the federal deficit, they need to look at, at cutting off wars at the outset. Don't well, do the wars. And, and one of and the things that uh, Olympia FOR is into is bring our billions home. And Mark and yeah. I are into this. That's sort right. of, and we have yeah. a unique experience of saying yeah. as veterans, yeah. we are very much for this. Right. Let's close all these yeah. 83 different countries that we have foreign bases in, yeah. bring these people home. Right. We can take care of the veterans yeah. that need the care, plus provide the services you mentioned. Right. If we could stop the, stop the current wars, we'd save trillions down right. the road. And that's why, you know, just after the Iraq War, uh, Joseph Stiglitz and Linda Belimes wrote the it was the $2 trillion war. Uh -huh. I think it's now the $3 trillion yeah. war. Something yeah. else that Dennis Kucinich mentioned is that uh, when you talk about programs, health care, education, they always say, how are you going to pay for it? But they never ask that about the war. Right. Yeah, yeah, there's that double standard. Yes. Um, we, we mentioned early in the program the, the work that you do at Coffee Strong. Mm -hmm. um, I want to just mention a bit more about that. Um, currently, as we tape the program in early 2011, you're up there, one or both of you are up there at 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. pretty much every Friday. Yes. And um, I want to give the location and the address. It's it's uh, off of I-5. It's south of Tacoma, Lakewood, exit 122. If you take exit 122, go west, turn right, which would be north, onto Union. Look for Coffee Strong on the right. It's near a Subway sandwich shop. Mm -hmm. The address is 15109. Union Avenue Southwest in Lakewood. And um, um, it's important to know that, the, the, you know, your volunteer work is available for people. Uh, and so somebody watching the program might, either themselves or somebody they know or somebody they're related to, might need what you have to offer. Well, we leave resources there. Uh, for instance, uh, we have DVDs on successfully filing VA claims benefits, okay. and we have a number of those at Coffee Strong. Okay. And so when people come in and they say, oh, well, Mark and Dennis aren't here on Wednesday, uh, but here's a DVD, right. it's an hours program. Yeah. It was filmed here actually in Thurston Community yeah. Television Studio. Right. Uh, and they can take that home and watch it, uh, or they can call us if it's a, a critical issue. Yeah. Both of you, and I've watched it, it's very good, very informative. Um, both of you are active in the peace movement, and why are you volunteering so much time uh, to help active duty soldiers and uh, military veterans? Well, in my case, it's simply it's a way of giving back. I have skills that I've developed, uh, you know, working as an investigator in the public sector. I know my way around bureaucracy. It doesn't scare me. I can find my way through it. I can help them figure it out and make the claim. And it's also a way of, you know, I'm trying to address the full cost of the war.
And that really is the, the issue that drives me is the full cost of war mm -hmm. needs to be addressed. And uh, those that have been affected by war uh, should be compensated for that. And, and that motivates me. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that will have some impact on people considering the next war, which I'm already against. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's right. Also, something that's in the news recently, we just saw the death of the last World War I veteran. Yeah. And in the stories about it, they point out how, you know, they got nothing when they came home. Oh, yeah. You know, and even after World War II, when the World War II vets got very generous benefits, World War I be uh, veterans were unable, couldn't, still couldn't get claims. Well, they, there was an effort during the Depression for World War I veterans to go to Washington, D.C., yeah and press vigorously to get the bonuses that were promised to them. And Night, they, for 1945. And, and, and they, they were rebuffed and violently rebuffed. Yes. And uh, so that, you know. So we've learned at least something. You know, we know yeah. that we need to do something for the veterans, but I don't know that yeah. we necessarily do enough. And clearly, you know, World War II veterans got excellent benefits. Vietnam veterans, not quite so good. Uh, more recently, we have a new GI Bill that does go back more toward the World uh -huh. War II type be uh -huh. uh, benefits. Yeah. Mark and I say we are anti-war, mm -hmm. but pro-soldier. Mm -hmm. And that means we are for, as you address, the humanity of all of us right. there. Uh, and we are for these people and try to see what we can do to help them in their situation. Right. And as I mentioned at the outset of the program, one of the things that is a recurring theme is that we all share a common humanity mm -hmm. and we're all in this together. And it's not a surprise that two peace activists like yourselves are volunteering in this way uh, or that we're covering your story on this peace related TV program. Uh, and I know you did a Veterans for Peace program on the topic that this was related mm -hmm. to. But it, it's, um, there, there are a lot of occasions in, in this uh, story where peace folks and military folks have collaborated, certainly in, in working against Agent Orange and the dioxins, where you had peace people, environmentalists, epidemiologists, military folks, veterans, all working on that together, trying to force the government to do the right thing. Uh, peace folks and, and uh, uh, veterans worked on Gulf War Syndrome, trying to get the government to take responsibility on, on that. We've worked on depleted uranium. Um, and so there, there's a lot that we have in common, and we, there is a lot of collaboration. And, people and, it, and it goes back quite some time. I mean, during Vietnam, we had Vietnam veterans against the war. Oh, yeah. Uh, there were very powerful protests against the war. Uh, veterans for Peace uh, is, not a, is a group that grew out, out of that. And, you know, and we as veterans, we could speak with a certain level of credibility. Right. Um, you also, Mark, went back to Vietnam in December 2010. Yes. Can you tell us just a little bit about that? Uh, that sure. That was I wanted to go back to do something constructive, and I was able to arrange a uh, an opportunity to teach to work in the English language department of Da Nang University. And at that point, I saw I had a chance to see Vietnam in a very different light—a country at peace, uh, very vibrant uh, group of young people, very active. I mean, I know the country has, still has many challenges, but it was so different than what I saw in the war because, you know, here the, this time around, I actually got to meet Vietnamese and talk to them. Right. I like to say the first time around, I was like, I never left the U.S. because I never was out, I never engaged the Vietnamese yeah. culture. So this was, it gave me a chance to see Vietnam in a whole different perspective. Yeah, yeah. I want to... Uh do a, just a little bit about conscientious objection, which is an issue that comes up for people in the military as it does when people are thinking about the draft. Um, federal law has, since 1940, allowed for conscientious objections, and, but there's a lot of misunderstanding about what that is. And in the military, there's a procedure to invoke that and work the process to get out, but it's the criteria for what qualifies as a conscientious objector that most people, I think, don't understand. You don't need to be a complete pacifist. In fact, Muhammad Ali, who was the world heavyweight boxing champion, um, successfully uh, was declared a conscientious objector um, after some difficulty. And, uh, and he was a heavyweight boxing champion. But there's a difference between boxing, where you have rules, and you're mm -hmm. not trying to kill somebody, versus being in war. Uh, so you don't need to be a total pacifist. You don't need to 
um, have a religion with a capital G, God. You have to have that deep sense in your heart that you can't participate in war because of your beliefs, your conscience, but it can have unconventional um, beliefs. It doesn't have to be something that's a standard orthodox kind of thing. Um, so more people qualify than otherwise might think, but it's not just like saying, oh, I don't want war, or war is stupid, or war is expensive or messy, so I don't want to do it. That's not sufficient. It's got to be at that deep conscientious level uh, where the beliefs are uh, sort of as serious as those who are conventionally religious mm -hmm. holding beliefs. And we're seeing people coming back after two, three, and four deployments mm -hmm. that are asking questions now like, um, what do you know about conscientious objector uh, claims or status? Uh -huh. So those type of questions are coming through right. and the GI rights uh, hotline helps them with that information. And there's so. always a sense that, well, you chose to go in the military, you've already been over there and you fought, so how can you be a conscientious objector? And the point is that at a certain point you realize, I don't believe in this. This does violate right. a very deeply held belief. Right. And people, uh, any of us at any time during our lives has some experience that will move you in some way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there, somebody will have some ex experience and it change their life in some way. Yes. And so certainly somebody who's been in war can have that deep level uh, spiritual uh, turnaround that says, this is just completely wrong. My conscience won't let me do this anymore. And that's perfectly fine. So I, people, I just want to make sure that people know that. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and again, more information about this is available at the GI Rights Hotline. I'll give you that number and website again. It's toll free. 877-447-4487. The website is www.girightshotline.org. And if people miss that, we can, they can contact mm -hmm. us. Uh, we'll have the Olympia FOR contact information at the end of the program. Um, both of you are active with the organization Veterans for Peace, and I wonder if you could tell us about the overall uh, purposes and principles of Veterans for Peace uh, nationally, and then then let's talk about the local. But national, what what's Veterans for Peace all about? Well, it's a national organization of people who served in the military and also supporters. You, you don't have to be a veteran to be a member of the Veterans for Peace. You have and associate have, members? Associate yes. members, yes. And there are five basic principles, uh, some of which I might remember. One of which is to end war as an instrument of national policy. Uh, second is to care for those who have been injured uh, and harmed victims by war, of war, victims of war. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the others? Well, it was the, the educate the people about the cost of war. Yeah, yeah. And it, you know, it's been, it was founded in 1985. Uh, members participated uh, and worked in Central America when uh, we were intervening there and have done, a, were in Iraq providing uh, drinking water uh, prior to the war. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not a member of it until this particular war. I met some mm -hmm. veterans uh, in Phoenix when I was living there and mm -hmm. joined up and I've been active ever since. And one of the things I like about being a veteran for peace as opposed to being a Vietnam mm -hmm. veteran against the war is mm -hmm. I want to be for peace. We present ourselves, you know, we're not, against, and we're not anti. We uh -huh. are in favor of peace yeah. and we want to see that as a form of national policy. Mm -hmm. Locally, uh, both of you are active with Veterans for Peace Chapter 109, the mm -hmm. Rachel Corey Chapter here in Olympia. Tell us, you've done a lot of good stuff over the years. Uh, what are some well, of the accomplishments we, we over the years? we continue to have a monthly program at the last Thursday of the month on KAOS, which is our community access uh, radio station. Mm -hmm. And we also have a, a month, monthly uh, television program, which we call the Veterans Hour. Mm -hmm and it's produced here in the studios of TV, and then we afterwards, uh, once it's been shown, we put that out on Blip TV so that people anywhere that have an internet connection can see that program. Very similar to what FOR right. has there. And they can watch that through the website uh, www.vfp109rcc.org. Yeah. And, and you which, go which there you and then you can click on a whole thing and you go down to where it talks about yeah. the various television programs yeah. and, and it has that. Yeah. And, and you've sponsored peace activities, locally peace rallies and 
events and speakers and right. all kinds and of things. We've been active in many of the, the observances of the anniversaries of the war. We have worked with FOR we're yeah. on various campaigns. This, this year we're on the Bring Our Billions Home. Yeah. In past years we did Arlington Northwest. Right. And certainly over the past couple of years, one of our major efforts has been uh, supporting Coffee Strong. Yeah. You know, working with the current generation of uh, GIs to resist war. Mm -hmm. See, as a local chapter, we're really trying to find where can we have the most credible voice as veterans. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's one thing to vigil, which we still do. Yeah. Uh, but it's, are there other things that we can become involved yeah. in to where we can really uh, help people? Well, and, and have your own niche. Mm -hmm. right. So that there are some things that you, you folks can do as veterans that other folks can't do. Um, and the, your work at Coffee Strong certainly is one of them. And when you do the Arlington Northwest, the display of the grave markers to mm -hmm. simulate those who died, that's powerful uh, and credible. And we've become involved with the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers yeah. uh, coming up very shortly. Matter of fact, this weekend, uh, well, which will be too, our, yeah. too late for our viewing mm -hmm. audience. But there'll but be another one, I'm we sure. We have quarterly listening, days of listening, to where we actually uh, provide the internet connections uh, to Afghanistan and so people from many, many countries right. uh, talk to these young people over there right. and their desire to have peace and you know their theme was why not love. Right. Uh, and so we become involved in helping to support the uh, mechanism to put on these days of listening. Yeah. In fact, one of the highlights of my trip to Vietnam was joining in from Da Nang. I, I was just going to mention that, that, yeah. that uh, I was... Uh, uh, down at Traditions when we had the the computer hookup and and you and your wife Maggie called in from Vietnam yeah. mm -hmm. on that as part of that. We had people from all over the world. That was really something. One of the things that, that you want to do when the National Veterans for Peace holds their annual conference in Portland, Oregon is yes. to have a workshop on the kinds of work that you're doing and urge that more of that happen elsewhere. Well, and one of the things that we found out is not every organization is blessed like we are here in Thurston County to have access to tell our story on community access television yeah. or a radio station. Mm -hmm. And so they've said, tell us how you do this mm -hmm. because you, you don't have that many people in your chapter. We're not a huge chapter like others might be. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? So that's one thing that we do. And then they, um, they found out that hold it, you have training on how to become a veteran's benefit specialist or there. Others don't, you know, they yeah. send them to other chapters trying to figure out how they can get help. This is something that we feel we have a, yeah. a, a, a possibility. So Mark and I are uh, proposing to do in a workshop at this right. national and conference. Yeah. Also one thing to mention is the National Veterans for Peace is supporting our work by purchasing reference materials for us. Matter of fact, you want to okay. show that one yeah. particular yeah. Well, we, book. Yeah. Got, this we is, have two books. This is one of, size. One, of, yeah. one of two uh, that are essential to the work. Right. And it's not something you can easily look up on the internet. <laughs> well, only about 2,000 pages yeah. per book. And right. it costs about $200 a set, uh -huh. and they bought us the set. And yeah. it comes out every year. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but, you have to buy a new But if you're going to help a veteran you, file a successful you, you've claim, you've got to you know your to stuff. Know. And you yeah. do not want to be working with a 2007 edition. Right, right. Yeah. Because it's probably the same, but you don't want to take that chance. So um, we, we've, we've got a, just a few minutes to wrap things up. I want to see what insights you may have of things that people uh, could do to help. Folks watching the program might be interested and wonder how can they plug in. One of the things is to ask a person if, are they a veteran? And if so, um, have you ever filed for VA benefits for, as a result of your experience? Um, it's amazing how many people we know that are veterans, but we never think about asking them, um, have you filed anything right. with the VA before? That would be one thing that mm -hmm. anyone in our viewing audience could do. Uh, is just mm -hmm. to listen and to ask. Uh -huh. And I would add that just to think about, you know, the experience that vet veterans go through uh, in their military service, that they see things that no human being should really be ever exposed to. And that, does, like Dennis said earlier on, it changes them yeah. uh, to be aware of that and to, you know, help them find the assistance they need. Sometimes there, there's some resistance to that. Uh, so you can't push them, but you can certainly encourage them and be supportive. Mm -hmm. 
And I would hope that people would just be aware and informed of the kinds of fresh ways of looking at things that we've tried to do during this hour that may be different from the way people who see themselves as peace activists commonly do mm -hmm. or the way that people who might be veterans commonly do. But whatever situation you're in, um, recognize fresh ways of, of looking at things. Yes. Um, could each of you offer a closing comment? Actually, my comment would be, I, would, I don't think I will ever live to see it, but I think the ultimate goal would be live in a world where there are no veterans. You know, I could echo that, Mark. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, I never wanted to be a veteran. Uh -huh. <laughs> I got the opportunity not to worry about what clothes I wore for three years. Yeah. <laughs> and I would encourage any young people that are out there that are not sure about what they're going to do for their education benefits in the future, do not consider the military as a way to earn money to go to college. Right, thank you. Yeah, the, the recruitment pitch is very one-sided, mm -hmm. and somebody who's thinking about that needs to be an informed consumer and get other information and recognize that the recruiter is a salesperson who's trying to sell you something um, and not telling you the downside. Yes. So I want to thank Dennis Mills and Mark Fleming I want to thank all the folks who've been watching. War costs everyone in many ways. The U.S.'s current wars are bankrupting our nation financially and turning world opinion against us politically. Uh, beyond that, wars are costing our nation its soul. During this hour, we've focused specifically on how war hurts the people who fight and their families. Despite people's glib rhetoric that soldiers are heroes, the truth is that every combat soldier is wounded in several ways. Our nation must be mature enough to recognize these human costs and responsible enough to cover the financial and other costs. Wars damage the people on all sides, and we must take responsibility to heal the people on all sides. I respect the work that our two guests, Dennis Mills and Mark Fleming, uh, are doing to help active duty GIs and military veterans to protect their rights and to get the benefits that they deserve. You can find one or both of them most Fridays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Coffee Strong, 15109 Union Avenue Southwest in Lakewood. Take I-5 to exit 122, go west, turn right, that's north, onto Union and look for Coffee Strong on the right uh, near a Subway sandwich shop. And if you're watching this program after the spring of 2011, uh, the dates and times and location may change. But uh, anyway, I want to thank Dennis and Mark. Thank the folks who've been watching. You can get information about a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolence by contacting the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation at 360-491-9093 or visit www.olympiafor.org. We're all one human family and we all share one planet. We can create a better world, but we all have to work at it. And the world needs what you have to offer. Thanks.